All right, in this module, we will be looking at IP addressing for version four. And this will require a bit of mathematics and that horrible conversion between binary and decimal for us to be able to do all this stuff. So let's have a look at the basic structure of an IP address. An IP address is a 32-bit binary address, and it is split into two portions, a network portion and a host portion. And we use a subnet mask to define the size of each portion. So our subnet mask is <coughs> consecutive ones starting from the left hand side until we get to the host portion and then it turns to zeros. So a network bit is represented by one in the subnet mask as shown here. And the process that a router uses when it's making a forwarding decision because it only forwards to networks is it does an anding function between the IP address and the subnet mask which basically strips away the host portion of the address. So where there's zeros in the subnet mask it turns to zeros in the ANDed output, just leaving the network address behind. And that's that address is what it uses to make the forwarding decisions on. Now, <clears throat> subnet mask in longhand, in dotted decimal notation is here on the left what it represents in binary is in the middle and we have the CIDR notation or uh, prefix length um, on the right. IPv6 calls this a prefix length. Um, the original IPv4 notation which the forward slash is, is, was originally called CIDR notation because it came about when we introduced classless interdomain routing um, to increase the efficiency of IPv4. The Boolean operation or Boolean operation, whatever way you want to look at it, it's very simple. If it's a one in the mask, it's whatever the original value was. It just falls straight through. If it's a zero, it doesn't matter what the value was up the top, it turns to a zero. If you want to go through the mass of it, go for it. But most people just want to understand what it does. And the simplest way of saying that is it turns the host portion to zeros. So, <clears throat> After the ending function, you get this. All right, so 168.10.0.24. And that provides us with this entire 8 bit space for addressing. So 
the rules are we have a network address, a broadcast address, and everything in between it is a valid host address. So where it's all zeros in the host portion, this is the network address. Where it's all ones in the host portion, that's the broadcast address. Anything in between is a host address. So the first host is where we have one more than the network address. The last address for hosting is one less than the broadcast. So all ones except for the last one, which is a zero. And for the first one, all zeros except for the for the last bit, which is a one. If you remember though that basic concept, you will always be on the subnet address space and work out the valid host range for any network. Quick recap on what unicast is. A unicast is when I send a packet from one source to one destination. A broadcast is where I send it from one source to all other devices on that network segment. And a multicast is where I send it to multiple devices but not all devices. Now that we've done that recap, let's get into private and public address spaces. So <clears throat> private addresses are a block of addresses that can be used by anyone on their private networks. In other words, they do not get sent to the internet. These are 10, 0, 0, 0, slash 8, 172, 16, slash 12, 192, 168, 0, 0, slash 16. which is quite an interesting um, change. That's not 16. Because 16, yeah, yeah, 8 and 8, 16, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, that's right. And you're going, why were you disagreeing with that? Oh, it comes from the old, okay? The very old original IPv4 was classful, and we had class A addresses, class B addresses, and class C addresses. First subnet, 8, 16, 24. Prefix links. We'll get to that in a minute. There is a slide on the old classes. Okay, because we ran out of addressing in the original version of IPv4, we came up with CIDR notation where we had variable subnet mask lengths and we could do network address translating using those private addresses and a single public address and converting many addresses into one, which we're all used to seeing in our home routers now. So what it does is it allows you to use these private address spaces in your network 
and just have one public address on the outside interface and you translate these addresses into that address as you send it out to your ISP. <coughs> so it's a many to one translation. Now, documentation now just refers to it as NAT, but it's actually NATPAT. Okay, network address translation just translated an IP address for an IP address. PAT is port address translation combined with the network address translations allows us to transform multiple IP addresses and applications to a single IP address on the outside. Okay, special address. <coughs> We have our loopback address, the 127 network. This IP address is what we use to check that our network cards are functioning correctly in the TCP IP stack. So if we ping 127.001 or any of the addresses within the 127 network, we are checking to make sure our network card is functioning correctly. Local link addresses are automatically assigned addresses that are basically where Windows fires up and it can't find a DHCP server in the correct time. So it will give a local link address, which is the 169.254 numbers that you see pop up. Now this will occur, especially when you have devices booting up at the same time via connected via switches. Switches take a couple of minutes to fire up from a cold start before they can start forwarding frames correctly because they've got multiple states that they have to check learn listen and do all these other states before they start forwarding frames through their ports now unfortunately dhcp clients time out around about I think it's the five second mark if they don't get a reply from a server. Um, <clears throat> don't quote me on that. Um, I'm a little rusty. I haven't looked that one up for ages. So basically what happens is if your client boots up, it goes to the server, it can't find doesn't get a response from the server, it will use a link local address to give itself an, a working IP address so the network functions can um, activate. Okay, so this is the slide I was talking about. This is classful addressing. This is where IPv4 started. Okay, and there was all of our base rules came from this situation. So when IPv4 was created, it was divided into five classes of addresses. So class A gave the largest number of hosts per network. So this was only 128 networks, but each network could have 16 million hosts, individual hosts on the network. The next portion was class B, which was another 16,000 odd networks. And each of those networks could have 65,000 hosts. Now you notice I am rounding up to the nearest thousand. Then class C 
was the last of our usable networks for um, production networks. And this rounded out to a 2 million network count. Each of these networks could have basically 250 hosts on them. Now, <clears throat> you're going, that's only three, you said five. Class D and E were divided into the remaining portions here. Class D was our multicast addresses. Class E was reserved for future research applications. So there were specific rules about how you could use class D and class E addresses, who could use them, what they could be used for. Okay. Now, the rules for these classful addresses was very simple. It had a fixed subnet mask to start with slash 8, slash 16, slash 24. Okay. Now, that limited the number of networks that could be given out and the number of hosts per network. We could divide one of these networks into smaller parts called subnets but each portion had to be exactly the same size. Okay, so when you subnetted a network, if you borrowed four bits, okay, so you went from a slash 16 to a slash 20, all of those networks were slash 20. You couldn't have some slash 20, some slash 24, some slash 30s, like we do today. This generated a lot of wasted IP addresses. Um, I should also run through the very quick way of identifying the classes of addresses. Okay. In the very first octet on the left hand side, uh, pointer options in move back. Thank you. Okay. If the very first bit was a zero, it couldn't be 128. So it was class A. If you wanted a class B, it was a one zero. In other words, it was from 128 up to 191. Class C, first two bits were turned on, which gives you 192. Third bit had to be a zero. So if you keep looking at that, uh, 224 is three bits on, fourth bit off. Four bits on. And there you have how we filtered. Oh, this is class A. That's a B. That's a C, D, E. All right, the first sequence of bits in the very first octet. Remember, there's four octets in the 32 bits. So these first four bits here determined what class of address the network was, and then the characteristics and behaviors associated with that class.
bit of random history there for you. I'm an old fogey, so I like talking about the good old days. All right. <clears throat> Again, we've gone through this many a times throughout the other chapters. Internet addresses are assigned by INA and the regional internet re registers that look after addressing now. But for us, plebs, our service provider gives us our address range. So when we're looking at an enterprise that has multiple live addresses, they're given to us by the service providers when we subscribe to a service. All right, broadcast domains. General rule of thumb for you. Every layer three device has a broadcast domain attached to every interface. So every router, every interface is a broadcast domain. So all the devices that connect from that interface are members of a broadcast domain. So whenever a broadcast occurs on any device in connected to this interface via any of these switches, so there will be host machines connected all over the place to these switches and they are all members of the same broadcast domain because a broadcast is only stopped at a layer three device. Okay, so protocols such as DHCP, ARP, um, use broadcasts to find information and services within the local network. So all these switches will forward the broadcast on out through all of their ports and it will only stop at the router. Okay, so every switch needs to propagate the broadcast out of all of its interfaces because it's a broadcast. So the layer two address will be FFFFFF. Okay. And the IP address will be the all ones in the host portion. Okay. Now, the joys of this is there's another um, Uh, pointer options. Blah. Let's go put. Okay. There's another one called segmentation. Okay. The segments are the individual pieces of cable. Now, you can have multiple segments inside a broadcast domain. because segments are known as, another way we can look at it is a collision domain. Okay, so on a segment, traffic has the potential to collide with each other. And that is also known as a layer two, which we'll get into later. 
Okay, so segmentation, you look at layer two. So when you break a broadcast domain into smaller portions, you get more segments or segmentations. And basically what that is, is we break it up using layer three addresses. Okay. So the more broadcast domains we create, the lower the impact of a broadcast storm and we'll revisit broadcast storms and um, the connection between layer two and layer three and segmentation when we look at switching in detail which is in the next um, course unit. The problem with large broadcast domains is the more users we have within that domain, the bigger the effect of the broadcast. And um, what do you mean by that, Mark? It means <clears throat> here, if I send a broadcast, I'm affecting 400 users. Here, because I've split that 400 user network into two, I have 200 users. So if I broadcast in this network, I'm only affecting half the user base. To get to the same recipients, I affect 400 users, 200 users. So by breaking it up into smaller portions, I'm reducing the impact of each broadcast in the network space. So remember, each broadcast consumes network resources. So by breaking it up into smaller, more manageable portions, I'm effectively speeding up the efficiencies and delays and all that sort of stuff associated with large networks. Now, if you cast your mind back to when we were discussing, discussing, discussing the Ethernet frame and how it works. Remember, Ethernet is basically based on a shared media approach. So each network portion assumes that it's a bus and everybody is just teed off the same length of cable. So in this one, I'm saying there's 400 users teed off this one piece of cable. So when I send a broadcast from one device, I'm consuming this length of cable for a length of time that is greater than if I had two shorter lengths of cable separated by a router here. Okay, if I send broadcast over on this segment, it's only affecting half the users. So this half of the network is still running more efficiently than this one because this one they all stop and process the broadcast this one doesn't have to stop it keeps working so there's by eliminating the impact of a broadcast by reducing the number of users 
within that shared space. You increase the efficiencies of your overall network. And one of those efficiencies is the delays in processing information. And this is where we come into reasons why we break up our network. So one of the reasons um, is geographic. So we want to segregate it on the physical location. So each floor has its own network. It's a bit problematic. Um, this used to be quite useful in the old business dynamics because you used to basically have in the old old days you would have HR sitting all up on one floor sales on another manufacturing on another all right each department would have its own floor and you could segregate based on floors quite easily because sales were together, manufacturing, whatever your departments were, were basically all research and development or everything like that. But that model requires a large number of interfaces on the router. And basically, the more interfaces you need on a router, the more dollars you have to pay for the router. So that was a fairly expensive way to do this. But it did allow for us to segregate based on our admin, students, HR, accounting, whatever the department functions were. And the benefit of that is that we could apply security policies based on the department. Like we didn't want everybody having access to the accounting information. We don't want students having access to administration so they can hack in and change their results for example and if you looked at war games which is a an old movie um that's what our main character did um he actually hacked into the school network and changed his grades so that he wouldn't get in trouble for spending so much time on the computer. So the other benefit as I rambled on on the last slide was the reduction in the number of devices affected by broadcast traffic. So <clears throat> One of the simplest ways of subnetting is to divide the network based on the boundary of the octet. So uh, slash 8, slash 16, slash 24. That's the most easy way of subnetting. So we take a class A network, which is a slash 8, and break it up into 254 networks and it becomes a slash 16 address. All right, so each one is very easy to do because we know we have a separate network for every single change now. So one, zero is a network, one's a network, two's a network, three, four, five, so on and so forth until 255. So it's very easy for us to just do that. Now, 
Now, it's not the most efficient way of breaking up the network. So now we basically use um, what's called variable length subnetting. And what that allows us to do is choose to bar continually borrow from the host portion and create more network bits. So for every bit that we borrow, we create two options. So borrow one bit, we create two networks. Borrow two bits, we create four, eight, 16, 32, 64. It's binary. Hopefully you remember back in chapter six, how binary works. So here is a starting point from slash 16. So if we make it a slash 17, we've now got two networks of 32,000 hosts and so on and so on down the slide. So basically by borrowing more bits, we increase the number of subnets. But so as our subnets rise from the number of net subnets that we create, we reduce the number of hosts that we have available per subnet. Okay, so this is just going on about the same thing. So basically, if we borrow one bit, we get two options. Borrow two bits, we get four options. So that's just our zero and one. So that's one bit. If we borrow two bits, well, we get zero, zero, and then zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. And that's quite reasonable considering that was the mouse. Um, again, if you borrow another bit, well, you get double the options. So you have all the zeros and all the ones. You get the gist. So it doesn't matter where you start from. in the network so you can divide any existing network into smaller net portions that's all what we're saying here we can take from the slash 8 slash 16 slash 20 it doesn't matter what the parent is we can always borrow from the host portion to create new subnets. And we do this using the slash eight, slash 16, slash 24, so that we can divide our networks into our smaller, more manageable portions that we want to apply different addressing or different functions within those portions of networks. For example, what do we do when we want to address private networks, public addresses, and the internet? Okay, so we have typical firewall, um, segmentation demilitarized zone where we want company resources to be available to the internet to our client base 
So this is our servers and things like that, that we want our clients to have access to. So we segregate these servers into the DMZ and we make them a part of the public address space so that traffic can come in and access them. But we want to hide on a different portion our internet, our internal network, and the internet users cannot get access to this because we have the firewall, net address, translation, so the outside world cannot see this network. But we want to be able to access and update our servers and access the internet and have traffic flow back to our replies. But we don't want this traffic coming in from the internet on its own. So having a DMZ router set up allows us to safely navigate all of that access. Let's clear that up. So basically what we're saying here is the internet can come in, access our public servers, but are blocked from accessing our private but our private network has access to both of those domains or areas. <coughs> and one of the ways we can do this is by putting public addresses in here in our DMZ. So they're live addresses and then private addresses over here. There's more to setting that up, but we'll just leave it at that. So again, we want to minimize the wastage of addresses when we do subnetting. So we can always borrow bits to create our sequence. It doesn't matter where we start from, as long as we're starting from a network that is already in use, in this case was a slash 24 and we're breaking it up in the smaller parts. Now why do we want to use this variable length subnetting? Alright, so our service provider has given us a address up here to use All right this one here and we need to cater for 30 public addresses there 10 there 15 there now we've got all different sizes now in the original scheme we would look at this and go What's the largest number of addresses that we need to have? Okay, it's 40. So to get 40, we would have to use one, so two, four, eight, 16, 32, 48. No, that doesn't work. Oh, 64. I was just checking to see if anybody was awake out there inside this land. All right. So to get our 40 users, we would have to make sure that we had one, two, three, four, five, six host bits. Okay. 
So if we've got 10 host bits, but we've got to make sure everybody has at least six in all these segments, that only leaves us four bits. All right. So those four bits we could use to divide our network. So we would come up with a slash 26 address space. All right, so, and that's what we've done. So how does that work? Well, we're using, we have a decimal boundary there. That's our addresses. So if that's now our satellite mask that we're using for our network portion, those four bits. This is our first network that we can use. That's the second. That's the third. That's the fourth. Okay, so how many do we need? Zero, one. All right, so this is zero. So that's 172, 16. And that is zero, dot zero. Then this is zero dot sixty four zero dot one twenty eight zero dot one ninety two and then we go one zero zero so we have created quite a number of that we can use. So we can just allocate those across as we need to. Now, we've got to remember we have to allocate those outside and inside because our service provider is using these networks to connect as well so they're providing connection between all these networks and we need connections inside of these networks so we need one network out here one network in here, one out there, one in here. Now, this is not how I would do it, but for this example, you get the gist. So for every connection on a router in our network, we need to assign a subnet to the inside and a subnet to the outside. Now, all these connections share the service with the ISP. So technically, they could all reside on the same network. Okay. Um, excuse my So the benefits is on those links between our routers, we would have consumed 64 addresses instead of having the two 
addresses that we needed, we would have consumed 64. So we waste 60 addresses per connection doing it that way when it's a point to point connection. So a better way of doing it is have variable subnets, masks, and the way we do that is if you consider we have a pi, we divide a pi into portions and then we can take a portion and divide it into smaller portions as we need. Okay, that's what variable length subnetting allows us to do. So we've got 25 hosts here, 10 hosts there. So we can go in and instead of having exactly the same number of hosts allocated, so using the same subnet mask, we can change the subnet mask length and recover those hosts. So slash 27 means there are five bits left, which gives us a total of 32 minus two equals 30 hosts. Y minus two. Remember, there's always the network address and the broadcast address on every network. So they're reserved. You can't allocate them to hosts. So in this scenario, we've got 30 usable addresses, even on these point to point links. So we only need two, so we're wasting 28 addresses for every point to point link. So if we used a slash 30 address, that gives us two hosts per link, and we recover those 28 hosts. Okay. So in here we're saying, there's got to be a way we can recover those 84 addresses that are just wasted under the old addressing scheme. And we can do that by using the variable length subnetting and creating these slash 30 networks, which means we've recovered all those addresses and this is what I was trying. This is a much prettier representation of the pie chart. So our original subnetting was slash 27. So we had 30 hosts in every segment. And we went, no, that's too inefficient. I'm just going to divide one of these segments. Oh, knock her off. Into smaller parts using a different subnet mask and then allocate this little wedge of addressing to these networks down here. So that is basically how we use variable length subnetting today. We look at the number of hosts that we require in each segment of the network and do our addressing based on that. And the rule of thumb is we find the largest requirement and then do our divisions based on that and go from large to small, Okay, so we can recover 
and increase our network address usage by using that approach. And this is what's called a structured design. And you're going, how am I supposed to get my head around all of this? Well, by doing them, doing practice. How am I going to do practice? By working your way through the subnet workbook that I'm going to post on Discord as part of this chapter. Okay, so basically by looking at our topology and using some just basic design principles where we look at how we're going to address and coming up with um, our segmentation policies and then how we're going to individually address the hosts within those segments. So we're going to have clients, servers, printers, scanners, all requiring addresses. And same with our switches and uh, routing gateway addresses, all need addresses within the network space that they service. Now, we don't want servers and printers and that to be allocated random IP addresses every time they start. So we basically want servers and printers and things like that to have a static address. So we tend to manually configure those and then leave the rest of the address space to the DHCP pool to push out to the end devices. Now you can set up your multiple DHCP server pools, which is your address spaces, and in there you can record like the device's MAC address saying when this MAC address requests a DHCP license, like printers, for example, you know, under this energy conscious regime today, you might move printers around and you can have them requesting DHCP IP addresses to be assigned based on where they're plugged in. There's all sorts of things we can do with the DHCP and we can say, okay, if it's on this segment of network, it gets this address space and it's in the printer. So therefore it gets it out of this address pool. There's lots of funky things we can do there, but as a general rule of thumb, printers, servers, Gateways, intermediate devices have static addresses, and then the rest are available via the pool in DHCP. And you're going, thank God, this is over. Yeah, I understand. So we had a look at the 32 addressing space in IPv4, how the subnet mask is used to determine the host and network portion of our address space. We looked at how we migrated from a fixed size uh, regime of networks to a variable regime of addressing to recover IP addresses so that we can use them in other circumstances. Now, remember, we were looking at it from a perspective of 
a local area network. But these address problems impacted all of our service providers. Okay? Because they would have to chunk up their networks in equal sizes. So when they allocated addresses, they were allocating a whole portion, regardless of how many you needed. So they consumed and wasted a lot of addresses just trying to give you a service. So when we say we had to recover, we ran out of IPv4 addresses. We did that many years ago and we patched IPv4 with CIDA notation, so classes in a domain routing that allowed us to use NAT and variable length subnetting and re allow us to only use the number of network addresses that we need for that portion efficiently. And by doing that, we released a whole series of addresses back into the pools, especially from an ISP perspective. They recovered so many addresses, which extended the lifespan of IPv4. And as more and more organizations cut to IPv6, they release their original IPv4 address blocks back into INA to be reused. And that's enough for me rambling on. What I will be putting up is a workbook, which is IPv4 addressing. And it has a description of doing it, which is one way of doing it. You don't have to do it that way. You find the way of addressing and calculating that works for you. I do it in one fashion, and I'll make a video f available for you um, running through the first couple of questions in the workbook. I'll grab some questions here and there out of the workbook and tackle them in a video showing you how I um, subnet and answer those questions. And then you have to develop the method that works for you. I don't care which method you use as long as you are getting the same answers. When I say the same answers, I'm talking about a valid design. I'm not talking about you must assign exactly the same address sizes to every single thing that I the same way I do. All what I'm asking is that you be able to come up with the basics the same. So you need to be able to calculate the network address, the broadcast address, first and last host address for any network that you are given. And that way we can do uh, basic design and allocation of addresses to each segment of the network that we build. All right, so this is the introduction. I'll make some other videos and go through it. This is the, the hardest concept to grasp is IP addressing. People think it's white man's magic. Um, until that little light globe goes on. 
it's the hardest thing people have until they get the concept and get comfortable using it then they all turn around and say oh it's not that difficult after all it's like any other process it seems a little difficult and overwhelming at the start but the more practice you get the easier it becomes if that makes sense